you stay a while and listen. Today, I want to tell you about someone very important from Norway. You may or may not already have heard of him. His name is Olav Haraldsson. He was also known as Olav Digre, or Olav the Huge. For those of you that have heard of him, you might know him under a different name. Saint Olav. Olav the Holy. He is these days known as the Perpetual King of Norway. But before I tell you about his death, I want to tell you about his life. He was born in the year 993 in a place in Norway called Ringerike. And his parents actually had some claim to fame themselves. His father, Harald Grenske, died before he was born, and it is said that Olaf's father was the great-grandchild of Harald Fairhair, the first king of a unified Norway. Now, it is a little bit uncertain how true that claim is, but it did give Olaf some political clout, which he uh, later on in his life used to his advantage. Now, his mother, Osta, uh, was apparently the, let's see, great, 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 great grandchild of Ragnar Lothbrok himself. Now, after the death of uh, Olav's father, she remarried and had another son uh, by the name of Harald Harrode, who also became king of Norway. Now, Snorri Sturlason, the author of the Edda, he described Olav as quite a handsome man, big and strong. Now, this might have been influenced by the fact that Olav became a saint. So, Snorri might have wanted to embellish a little bit, as authors are known to do, and especially storytellers. Um, we do know, however, that Olav had the nickname Olav Digre, Olav the Huge, and apparently quite like this nickname. So, we don't think that it meant that he was fat but that he was big and strong, broad of shoulders, thick with muscles. Now, some of the things I'm about to tell you are slightly uncertain in terms of chronology and when it came to pass, so bear with me. There's going to be a few names, there's going to be some years, but I hope you will forgive me about that. From around the year 1008, when uh, Olav was around 15 years old, he was the sworn man of a Scanian Jums Viking by the name of Turchel Höge, from the south of Sweden. Now, according to the texts and the, the resources we've found, it seems like Turchel acted kind of like a, like a foster father to Olav. The year after Olav swore, was, uh, Tor became Turchel's sworn man in the year 1009, Turchel took all of his men and he attacked London itself. Now, both the Skaldic verses and the Chronicles agree that Olav was a part of this attack. Two years later, Turchel attacked the British Isles again with a force of 2,700 men, 
which all that was part of. After a long siege, they managed, through deception, to gain entry into Canterbury. They pillaged and massacred, and the ones that survived the attack, they claimed ransom for. The year after, in 2012, Olav, with a squad of men, tried to attack the village of Newmouth. I have no idea how it's pronounced. It's in Suffolk. Now, the attack itself was actually a disaster. And Olaf was actually injured in this attack. However, we don't think it was very disastrous. He uh, recuperated finely enough and suffered no lasting debilities. After this, Turchel began service with the English king to defend England from the Danish. Now, at this point, Olaf and Turchel parted ways, and Olaf, not long after this, found himself in the service of Duke Richard II of Normandy, and for the next two years, Olaf plundered and fought his way through Normandy and Bretagne, Aquitaine, Tui and Baskerland, Poitou by the River Loire, before they went back to Rowan to spend the winter. And by the spring of 1014, Olav was reunited with Torichel, as Olav had joined the army to conquer England back from the Danish that currently held it. But the next year, and we have no idea how this came to pass, we suspect that there was some kind of intrigue and uh, little skullduggery and uh, underhanded dealings. But when the Danish king, Knut the Great, returned to England, Turichel and Olav changed sides. They joined with the Danish and stayed with them until they had conquered Wessex. What happened in Wessex at the end of that campaign is a little uncertain, but we do know that it would change Olaf's life and influence his decisions for the rest of his days. What we do know is that Olaf returned to Norway with two merchant ships. Now, some texts claim that Olaf had been, been promised Northumbria for his services to Knut. But what we do know is that Northumbria went to another man instead. Now these texts claim that this enraged Olav. Some other historians claim that Olav took the advantage of seeing the reigning Jarl in Norway being away in England so he could so Olav could travel home and lays claim to Norway. Others say that Olaf traveled home with the blessing of King Knut, who had transferred the power from the Jarls of Lada to Olaf himself. Whatever the truth may be, it is evidently an important turning point in Olaf's life. Now, the life of Olav Haraldsson wasn't just about fighting and warfare and political intrigue. He was actually also considered an accomplished skald, a poet. There are 18 preserved skaldic stanzas attributed to Olav. There are slight disputes of how many he actually wrote, but when you read these skaldic verses and poems, it becomes clear that sex was often on Olaf's mind. Most of the stanzas are erotic love poems, and in some of the sagas, the author 
thought that they were too naughty to even include in the texts. Back in Norway, Olaf started his campaign to become king of Norway. He knew that he had to take the power away from the Jarls of Lade in the middle of Norway. One of the first things he did was to attack the son of one of the Jarls and take him prisoner. And he showed him mercy, however, by giving him amnesty in return for banishment from Norway. The year after, the brother of Eirik Jarl returned to Norway with a fleet of ships intent on stopping Olav and his campaign. A great battle ensued in a fjord in the middle of Norway, but the brother of the Jarl quickly became overrun and he fled the battle. It is a little uncertain what happened in the time thereafter. It is clear, though, that Olav proclaimed himself king, and he even minted coins with his face on them. Now, because of this, at some point, he would have broken his allegiance with King Knut in order to proclaim himself king. Sometime after his proclamation, he entered into an alliance with the Swedish king, Olof Skötkonung, and married his daughter. And together with the Swedish king, he tried to conquer Denmark while King Knut was away in England. But this ended in disaster when King Knut returned. Olaf had to leave all of his ships and fled back to Norway. Now, during his time and his reign in Norway, Olaf started to uh, Christianize Norway. And when he returned from Wessex, he had brought along four bishops and a whole bunch of priests. Now, the bishops were the important part because they were the only ones that could ordain new priests. Now, just to make something clear, there, there were Christians in Norway before Olav. There were also pagans and heathens after Olav in Norway. But what Olav did was that he changed the laws to reflect Christian values. And during a meeting between the bishops and the king's men, something called the Christian law was put forward and the church was tied to King Olav as a state church. And the sagas even claim that Olav traveled to the different things in Norway and got Christianity proclaimed as the official religion. Olav's star was undoubtedly rising. But the start of his end was coming, and with it came everything he wanted. The price for all that he desired was only his life. The end came with a returning king in rage. The end of Olaf Haraldsson and the birth of Saint Olaf the Holy. Thank you for listening.